Have you ever wanted to try to fish where I live, right here on the nature coast? Well, if you do, you've probably got a little bit of apprehension. You've probably heard lots of stories about skegs missing, lower units, holes in boats, and all those can happen to you, I promise. But if you hire a professional guide, you'll eliminate many of those. But if you're in a kayak or you're in a small skiff and you go slow, I'm going to give you 10 clues on how to find fish here. That's right, 10. So uh, let's go back down to the studio and we'll sit around and we'll mull over those 10. Come with me. Class YouTube is brought to you by Aquatraction, your go-to solution for advanced marine flooring. All right, we're doing pretty good on time here. Uh, I love doing these things mostly in the studio because it's just more controlled, especially these pieces here where I I've gone out and I've shot a little bit of video, but I like to, to, to walk you through it. Now, as I said in the intro, my best advice to you, if you want to explore this coast and start fishing it from time to time as a newbie, hire a professional guide. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Not just the holes in your boat, stuff like that. It's, it's difficult to find fish here. It really is. Uh, there's so much of it that is undeveloped. And the fish move around so much based off tide height and current strength horizontally. Uh, that you could spend days here and get skunked every day. It's, it's a fact. It is a fact. You could get skunked every day. So you have to understand you're going to have to move around quite a bit. And a lot of the native guides do. You'll see them running and gunning all day long. You, being a newbie with no clues, you'd be afraid to do that, or you should be afraid to do that, because you'll actually get yourself in trouble here. You'll get stranded, or you'll wreck your boat, or, or, or both. Um, so I'm going to give you the top three clues right away. And these apply for every given area. It doesn't matter where you live. If you're on the East coast, North Florida, in the panhandle or down in South Florida, the three things you need to know the most about is a clean water. You got to have clean water. We stress that all the time about every place. You got to have clean water. Um, for me, clean water means a healthy uh, fishery, a healthy area to start looking for fish. If I have muddy water, it's going to be a lot more difficult to kind of go through the clues as, you know, as I'm trying to deduce where the fish will be. But if I've got clean water, I can do that a lot easier. I can see the bottom better. I can see the depth changes better. And I can actually see the fish or at least the signatures that the fish kind of mudded off. So clean water, number one, and I wrote that down. I'll show you my list here. Number two, structure. You got to have a variety of structure. It just can't all be the same. That makes it even harder. When you fish something that is static, where everything looks exactly the same, the same depth, the same type of bottom, uh, and you're going for miles, I mean, it's going to be difficult to locate fish. Um, what's going to predicate whether they're or not, what holds them? You got to figure out that structure thing. What is structure? Structure to me is grass, potholes, rocks, oyster. Um, in some cases, it's locations like creek mouths, coves, points, things like that. Um, but structure is definitely going to be your first clue on patterning why fish are there um, oftentimes. Uh, and like I said, that could be depth changes as well. So structure is very big. That would be definitely number two for me. Number three, availability of food or bait. What bait is there? Because you're going to need to know that. Is it mullet activity? That's probably the one that most of us clue in on. No matter where we fish, especially here in Florida, mullet activity is definitely something that tells us, hey, 
That's the grocery store there. That's the zone. That's the groove. You've heard it a thousand times. But you also got to consider, are you seeing mud minnows in the creek? Are you seeing pinfish flash in the grass? Um, are you seeing shrimp skip kind of off a shoreline, you know, where there's a marsh edge? Are you seeing plenty of, of, of different types of fish? Ballyhoo, uh, ladyfish that are slashing around, things like that. Those are all clues. Glass minnows, all big clues. So in review, the first three, clear water, structure, bait. And that really applies for everything. This is where it starts to change. All right. What are the, the next level of clues? And again, this could apply anywhere, just not here. Bird life, number one. Now, much of the fishing that I do is push polling uh, clients around to sight fish redfish. And I've been known for that for 25 years or more. But we also focus on snook and certain times of year we target speckled trout and, uh, and other times of year we're fishing for tarpon. Those are the big four that we're fishing for most of the time. Now, for me, the bird life is definitely clue number four. I'm looking for wading birds, especially if I'm thinking about catching redfish. Here's, here's a video right here you should go check out. Check this video out of what I mean by wading bird life, and then we're gonna come right back, I promise. When you see concentrations of white birds like these herons and egrets and ibis and even white pelicans up on this flat, that's an excellent bellwether that there's going to be redfish in the mouth of this creek. This is exactly what you should be looking for right here. Good example. Apologize for the wind in the mic stuff. That's just, you know, it's that time of year when you get lots of, of breezy days. But when you see that type of activity, those birds are are pushing around and looking down and they're eating lots of invertebrates and that have perished on the drier tide. And they're just looking around, they're eating stuff. Well, you can imagine as that tide moves back up and it covers all that dead stuff that they didn't get to eat at all, that that aroma, if you will, that, that wafting of, of smells that are gonna be carried in the tide are gonna wake up a lot of sheep's head. They're gonna wake up a lot of black drum and they're gonna wake up redfish. When you see that signature, you should think that zone there is gonna have some redfish in it just as soon as the water gets high enough to cover their backs and tails. So that's a big clue. What other signs uh, of birds uh, or bird signatures should you be looking for? Well, in many cases, believe it or not, I'll look for floating brown pelicans, uh, diving pelicans, especially if it's shallow dives where I know that they're, they're eating smaller um, bait fish. Those are always a big clue. Off in the distance, if you can't see the mullet activity up ahead, lots of times if you see a flat that's further down the shoreline and you see kettling, you know, ospreys <laughs> that are just kind of making circles going around checking stuff up and then they hang up in the air and then they dive back down, that's gonna tell you that there's probably a plenty of mullet down that way. Um, so birds will clue you in on mullet, they'll clue you in on glass minnows, they'll clue you in on, uh, if they're taking deep dives, those pelicans, they'll let you know if it's, if it's a bigger bait uh, in a little bit deeper water that they have to go a little bit deeper for. Turns are, are good um, bellwethers and gulls can be too, you know, when there's shrimp runs and things like that. So. Birds, very, very important. E even the ugly, wily comorant, when you see groups of them, um, they're there because there's probably speckled trout there and other fish that they can eat. Um, so they are definitely a, around the zone, if you will. So bird life, big time important. Uh, another thing that clues me in, or I would say would be the number five component for me for sure, would be current. I look for current. The bigger the moon, whether it be noon, uh, new or full, I know the bigger flats will show the current. 
you'll, you'll see the grass lay over. It'll just kind of go one way or the other. It'll just lay over and you know you've got some force. If that grass is kind of like more upright and not really moving very much, then it's smarter to fish um, a constriction, if you will, or a creek somewhere, a cut, a creek, someplace where the water narrows. Um, and the wind can help you there too, because if you play the wind in the same direction that current's in, it will give it a little bit more force and that will offer up a feeding opportunity to some fish. So especially predator fish. So that's what I'm looking for. In clue four and in clue five, I want bird life that tells me, hey, there's food there for sure because they're eating it and they're definitely confirming my, my I guess my hypothesis that that's a good zone. And two, current. Current is critical. That's a when you don't have current, fish tend to relax. They don't have anything to give them advantage. So think about that as well. All right, I'm gonna be back with clues six and seven next. All right, let's uh let's talk a little bit about clues six and seven. Now, basically, every clue I've given you, you can use anywhere. Have you noticed that? It doesn't really change whether you're fishing here on the nature coast. I did that to hook you guys. Or if you're fishing Flamingo. Or if you're fishing over in the creeks in Jacksonville. Or if you're fishing uh, Panama City. Um, or in East Bay and West Bay there. Choctahatchee Bay. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Tampa Bay. All these clues apply. So what's clue six? Clue six for me, muds and boils. What do I mean by muds and boils? Well, if you were to listen to some of my contemporaries out in Texas, they'll tell you all about muds and slicks. But here it's more about muds and boils. When you're flats fishing or creek fishing or backcountry fishing, um, you're looking for certain signatures. And these muds and boils come into, into, into play quite often. So you'll notice when you push through into a zone, you'll see boils up ahead if the glare is such that you can't see through the water and you'll see these round boils. It's almost like a, a, a whirlpool where the tail beat of a fish and him taking off has created a vortex underneath the surface and it's come to the top of the surface and you're like, wow, I spooked something off. But how do you know, you know what size these fish are or if they're the right fish? Well, there's not really a good way to tell. Typically, if fish are in the mullet size or smaller, they don't make that type of stuff. They don't make those boils on the surface as often. You'll see a rumble off or something like that, almost like these, these nervous pushes, but it's not, it's not a real push and it's not a real boil. And then sometimes you may blow over a zone on a drift and you'll see these little puffs everywhere. And especially if there's numbers of them, and that's typically mullet that have been down on the bottom You've, you've alerted them and they've taken off. And because their bodies are a, of a nominal size, they make a little mud puff. And if you get enough of them there mudding around, it'll actually make a giant mud. But those are always indicative of bait fish or, or, or mudding catfish or mullet. What you're looking for, and I don't know how you could say it any other way, is that mud that's a solid single mud or two that almost comes up and it mushroom clouds up where it definitely looks like a bigger fish with bigger body mass that was laying there still took off and it just brought that mud, sucked it right off the bottom and then it kind of just mushrooms off the top. That's what I'm talking about. That's a game fish mud. That's a snook. That's a redfish. Uh, trout will make them a little bit as well but that fish kind of slinks off when it goes out of trouble. It doesn't spook as hard. It kind of just slinks off and says, I know you're there. I'm not opening my mouth. But the rest of them, they make that big mud and boil. So that I would say is clue six. Clue seven, tide height. Again, I'm not telling you anything that wouldn't work in any body of water. Tide height clues you into where you should be fishing. Now, of course, there's some, well, but if, but in most cases, 
if the tide height is low, it's a lower phase of the tide, the fish will be further off the bank. They'll be sitting in deeper water. If the tide height is more full, it allows them to get up underneath the bushes or into the marsh or further back in the creek and makes it much more difficult to locate fish. But there are plenty of instances when the tide is very low and the fish are trapped in the back somewhere in a deeper pool. And there are plenty of in 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 inferences when you have a higher full tide and you're convinced they're under there, but they're actually further off the bank sitting in even deeper water because you got a big blue sky. So there's always those, but generalities say if you've got lower water, fish deeper, fish away from the bank. If you've got shallow situations um, or scenarios, um, or I mean, deeper, fuller situations, scenarios, where that water is really full and the wind has pushed it in, that's gonna make it a lot tougher. That's when you have to go to the very back of somewhere to try to fish. Now, for me, I'm gonna send you to clue eight and nine Go go look at this video right here, and I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Just watch this video here. All right, that cut there. Cuts like that are fantastic to find redfish on the other side of them. You want to be on the down tide side of those cuts. When I'm fishing the back of these creeks, or just, you know, around the mouths where you got these little tributaries that come off, that's what I'm looking for. Places just like that. They almost always have a redfish and sometimes a snook too. This snook, <laughs> this snook got me so excited. Uh, sight fished him out here fishing that. That's one of the other signatures that you're looking for are cuts like that. He was laying in the sand on this side of it. I dropped my push pole <laughs> to jump off the polling platform to catch this guy because I'm fishing solo today. And it's a nice 30 plus inch snook, uh, every bit of it. And you know, these are the signs that you're looking for, the, the structure, if you will, signs and structure that will help you catch fish. All right, let me get this guy freed up. Put him back where he belongs, in the pool. That was a nice snook. That was a nice snook. And, and something when I'm out shooting uh, videos for you guys, video tips, it, it's nice to be able to help put this information together with some some evidence and some proof if you will uh, but also make it more visual so you can understand the possibilities without this being just a talking head video where i'm teaching you something on how to fish okay so you watched the video you saw i was fishing um, the downside tide of or the current flow of that cut. Why was I doing that? Well, that fish has got its head into that cut and he's letting that water come through and he's looking to pick off stuff as it comes through that cut. It's gonna come over that cut because there's rock there and then it's gonna get down into that mud flat where he is and he's gonna race it down because he's just a better, bigger, stronger, faster fish. And that's what snook do. Now, if I were to come from the other side and throw it, I'd have to be pulling it away from him and that wouldn't look natural. Anytime you have a constriction like that, where the flow direction is really important, you have to come and bring the bait in the direction of the flow. Again, this works everywhere, just not here on the nature coast. I'm just using that as an example. That will work in every body of water you fish here in Florida and in other states as well. Um, so cuts are very important that way. Points are very important in the same way as cuts because when the water flows around a point, you'll see those bubbles in that flow, all the grass that's on the surface will be flying around that corner. It's another time when it's very, very important to make sure that your lure is positioned where it comes with the flow. If it does not come with the flow and it's going against the flow, it's not going to look natural and it's never going to get eaten. So cuts and points, those things are really important when it comes to how you present your lure, regardless of where you're fishing. Number nine, creeks. Now this one is kind of centric to my area um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. We have a lot of limestone here, which is 
the reason why it's difficult to move around. Um, Lots of times you'll be running around and you're like, oh, look at all this beautiful grass. There's grass. There's all this little algae looking grass. It's everywhere. There's no rocks here. Wrong. Wrong. There's a layer of mud that will hold these different types of grasses. And um, underneath that grass and shell hatch, uh, shallow mud, is this limestone cap rock, if you will. And that stuff there is as hard as the parking lot or the driveway pavement out there. It's, it's hard. I mean hard. We'll mess your stuff up. We'll ruin your day for sure. But it's very attractive to game fish. Um, they know that fish can't get away from them in those things. So the grass is more sparse. You also notice there's like a kelpie, uh, kelpie grass there that grows uh, and it'll tell you the flow of the water, which way you should be orienting or fishing your lures. But that kelpie grass acts almost like a way for that fish to set up behind it and race out and eat it. But there are lots of pepper grass and things like that in many creeks all over Florida, where when you fish creeks and rivers, that is true. So that's the kind of stuff when I'm fishing creeks is to look for those the back end of those creeks or those edges that have that limestone type of moon rock and that kelp in it and that flow that keeps it looking like that, that are great spots for fish, especially in the middle of the tide, to, to wreck baits. And here's a video of an example of those two types of structure. And I'll be back with number 10 because that was number eight and nine. Check it out. Another thing I look for is this type of bottom where you have rock with this kelpy looking grass it's nice to have mangroves as well but if you can find this especially this time of year you're going to find fish this is the structure you're looking for for sure and the last thing i look for oh, is all these little rocks this moon rock bottom that you catch in the backs of these creeks that is key <laughs> to catching these. Definitely key. <laughs> this guy is ready to go. I mean ready. And we're just tossing that little root beer gold minnow. And I'm kind of right here at the back of a creek. And again, you know, I've been working from the outside to the inside, following the tide and following the fish in. And looking for those signatures that we've been talking about all day. I don't say it enough, but it's nice to have some of that footage that will reinforce this lesson. All right, so what is clue 10? What could possibly be clue 10? You've about covered everything, and the only thing that was kind of unique to my area was that last clue with the, with the limestone and the moon rock uh, that is visible in many places that will hold heat uh, and hold crustaceans. And, and places where that brown kelp grass is are always good ambush spots, especially for trout and, and, for, uh, and for big snook. 10, trust the pattern. That's the, that's the clue. Once you figure out by looking at the first nine clues, you're going to notice that something in there is repeating itself. It's either going to be the type of structure, the type of bait, the type of tide height where these fish want to be. It, it could be any of those or more um, in many cases, or the flow of the current in a certain direction, or the lack of current because you're in a lee somewhere um, and they want to be in an eddy. But once you figure out the pattern that they like, and then that pattern repeats itself. What I like to call the pattern within the pattern that makes you say, oh, I need to look at my chart and go, well, that worked there. Maybe it'll work here. And you start getting to that point. When you start trusting yourself there, that is when you're figuring it out. You're finally figuring this stuff out and you're going to catch a lot of fish and you're going to catch them more frequently and more consistently. The one thing I can tell you about my water is you got to move, move, move. If you're not catching them in a particular zone, 
That's not going to change. It's going to stay that way. Many of us fish areas like over in Mosquito Lagoon and the Indian River um, that have big gaps between inlets and things like that, that chain, that nothing much changes as far as current or maybe tide height that much. Um, and even in places like Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor, you'll have bigger tides on the bigger moons, but the, the quarter tides or the neat tides, they don't move as much. Here, that changes so much with wind here. And you, there's lots of times where myself, I make a plan or, or, or one of the other guides will make a plan. And then you get out there and that plan has to change because the front got here too early and it blew the water out. Or the, the storm system, the low pressure system coming from the south is getting here a little quicker and pushing water ahead of it. And now I've got an extra foot of water I didn't count on. I can't fish any of the spots that I had scripted out for the day. Uh, so here it's about adapting and adapt and being on the move all the time here. You got to be on the move. You got to follow the fish. If you catch them in one zone, you're only going to catch them there for a certain period of time. And then they're going to move. They're going to follow the bait. They're going to follow the water. Uh, it's probably more important here than any other place that I fish other than the Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Flagler zone, um, where it seems that that is the same pattern there. But trust the pattern. That's clue 10. Trust the pattern. All right. Take a look at this last video and uh, watch these guys tailgate me on the way in. I mean, it's, it's really rude. Till next time. Captain CA for Flat Scotch YouTube, signing off.